Good evening, everyone. I want to first say thank you for joining me for this presentation put on by the East Ham Historical Society on the archaeology of Cape Cod, looking at the last 13,000 years of Native American history here. Uh, it's my first time ever doing a Zoom presentation, so I hope that everything goes smoothly. I have to say, I think the biggest drawback uh, to us not all being in the same room is that I will never know how many of you fall asleep during my presentation. I typically get five or six people to nod off, so I'll never know, you know, how well or how poorly I am doing at that. But anyway, um, my name is Dan Zoto. I am an archaeologist living on Cape Cod. I work in a sector of archaeology called cultural resource management, and we essentially go out ahead of certain construction and development projects and look for ancient Native American or early historic sites. And when they are identified, we try to come up with ways to mitigate any adverse effect that the development may have on these archeological resources. What I'm talking about today is a little bit different. Um, this presentation is about an analysis project that I did for the East Ham Historical Society where I looked at the Native American artifact collections that the Historical Society has at the 1869 Schoolhouse Museum. I inventoried and analyzed um, all of their Native American artifacts. I presented the results in a report that was submitted to the Historical Society and then I help them to redesign an exhibit um, focused on the native peoples of East Ham. Before I get into the results of the analysis, I'd like to go over some of the basics. So the first thing I'd like to do is explain what an artifact is. So an artifact is any object that was made or altered or used by someone in the past. When we are talking about Native American artifacts, for the most part, we are referring to stone tools. And that doesn't mean that Native peoples did not use objects that were made of wood or antler or bone or plant fibers. However, these types of organic materials do not preserve well in the acidic soils that we have here in New England. So archeologists working in the region are mostly left with the stone objects used by native peoples and we attempt to use those to recreate past behaviors and learn about native life. As an archaeologist I am trained to differentiate artifacts from natural pieces of broken stone and we find artifacts of various types and in various from various stages of production and use. So for example on the far left of the slide, we have a cobble that someone has just begun to shape into a stone tool. In the center, we have a flake of stone that is the byproduct of stone tool production. So when someone is making a spear point or an arrowhead, these little flakes of tool uh, stone are what come off in that process. And they are the most common type of artifact on any given archeological site. And on the right, we have a finished, uh, finished formal spear point and a drill. And these are the types of objects that I'm referring to when I mention artifacts throughout the presentation. So one of the first things that I did with this analysis project was to determine uh, what materials were artifacts and, and what were, were not. Uh, there were a few sort of my typical just rocks in there. Um, Native American artifacts, based on their uh, overall shape and style and the stone material they're made out of uh, fit into known types that have been given arbitrary names by archaeologists. So the first step in this analysis project was to categorize the materials um, into their known types. Now once we know, you know what type of artifact we're looking at, we can begin to figure out just how old it is. You cannot directly date a stone tool to know um, when it was made or used by a person. In order to date stone tools, you have to find them in association with some sort of organic material that can be submitted for radiocarbon analysis. Um, 
I just said a moment ago that in New England, we have very poor uh, preservation of organic materials. However, there are exceptions to every rule. And something that has been um, burned in the past has a much better chance of preserving in our acidic soils. Um, so archeologists typical, typically look for uh, things like charcoal um, to be able to get radiocarbon dates, which can give us uh, an estimate of when that carbon entered the archeological record. We usually have about a 30 or 60 year window um, that tells us when, when these events happened. Uh, an example of this, the image in the center of the slide, the uh, square of dirt there, is uh, an excavation unit from the Taylor Bray Farm in Yarmouth Port. In the lower left hand corner of that image is a dark stain and that is where someone had a fire uh, thousands of years ago. So we were able to collect charcoal from a burn feature like this and submit that for radiocarbon analysis to get a, an estimate of when this site was used by someone. If we are lucky enough, we can find a spear point in close association with that charcoal and then get a relative date of when that spear point was used. There have been so many pairings like that that have already been done in archaeology that I'm able to look at just that stone tool and give a rough estimate, usually within 500 or 1,000 years, um, as to when it was made and used. So the first thing I did with the collection was uh, figure out what types of artifacts we have, and the next thing I did was try to figure out how old they are. Um, so for this project, I looked at um, three different collections within the, um, that the East Ham Historical Society has. It was a total of 533 Native American artifacts. Um, almost all of them, I believe, had originated here on Cape Cod. I was able to tell that based on the artifact, artifact types, but also the stone materials they were made out of. Um, throughout this presentation, I am going to be mentioning uh, local stone materials and exotic stone types. Uh, local stone materials consist of, or artifacts made from local stones are those that are, are made from rocks that are picked up as beach cobbles. Um, on Cape Cod, there are certain stones such as rhyolite and quartz, which I have shown on the right here, that have the correct fracture properties to be predictably, predictably chipped into a stone tool. When I mention exotic materials, I'm talking about um, rocks that are not found on the Cape, but outcrop in other locations, maybe like the Hudson Valley of New York. To find those materials on the Cape, it means that someone has brought them here in the past. Um, well, anyway, I'll get into the, the first of the collections that I looked at at the Schoolhouse Museum. And the first one was the Reginald F. Radden collection. Uh, this consisted of 74 artifacts that were in two unlabeled cases. Um, so we didn't have a whole lot of information as to, you know, where these artifacts came from, what sites they might be associated with, but we did know who collected them. So after looking at the material, I really tried to, to figure out who um, this Radin guy was and how he amassed this collection of artifacts. Um, I found out that he was a dentist operating in Orleans and he was also in the, um, the early 20th century. He was also an avid artifact collector and somewhat of an amateur archaeologist. He went around and, and dug sites on the Outer Cape and, and brought the artifacts home. Um, knowing that, I was really hoping that maybe he documented some of his finds. Um, however, I was, was not able to track down his, his own documentation, but there was a, another archaeologist working on the Outer Cape at that time, a man by the name of Ross Moffat, who is one of the sort of godfathers of Cape Cod archaeology. And he took meticulous notes on his excavations, and he also made notes of other archaeologists and collectors that he interacted with at that time. And um, 
his notes are stored at the uh, Peabody Museum in Andover, Massachusetts. I was able to um, look through some digital scans of those, and I found several mentions of a Dr. Radden. Uh, most of them were actually complaining about Dr. Radden and his messy excavation techniques, how he would leave these archaeological sites in disarray. Um, but some very important information came out of these notes. Uh, the most important of which was that in 1936, Dr. Radden excavated uh, four Native American burials in Truro. I had, looking at the artifacts, suspected that some of them may have been grave goods, and finding this information confirmed that. Um, with these discoveries, the Historical Society and I decided to contact the Mashpee Wampanoag Historical Preservation Office and uh, inform them of what we had found out. And right now we are in the works of um, figuring out how to repatriate these grave goods to, um, to the tribe, which, which I think is, is a very positive thing for uh, the historical society of the tribe and, and everyone involved. Uh, because of the cultural sensitivity of a lot of these artifacts being grave goods, I'm not gonna discuss too many of the details of the Radden collection. Um, however, one, um, one group of artifacts that I, I would like to highlight are the, um, the objects shown on the screen now. Uh, this is a collection of eight plummets. A plummet is a net sinker or um, essentially a fishing weight. It could use, be used either to weigh down nets or tied to a line um, thrown over the side of a, a canoe and used just like we would use a lead weight for bottom fishing today. Um, in Moffat's notes about Dr. Radden, he indicated that in 1936, he had found 20 plummets at a place called the Rich Site in Truro. And I think that these items um, might actually be from that site. So that was, that was kind of cool. The next collection that I looked at at the Historical Society was the Henry R. Guild Collection. Uh, this consisted of 48 artifacts that were glued to an arrowhead shaped board. Uh, these items range in time from about 3,500 years old to right up until European contact in the early 17th century. Um, there was a note with this collection that said it had been, the artifacts had been collected from property that uh, Mr. Guild owned in the early 20th century. So Patty Donahoe did some deed research and figured out exactly where that was. And it turns out that uh, Mr. Guild collected these artifacts from his property along the Salt Pond Creek between the Nauset Marshes and the Salt Pond, not very far from the Schoolhouse Museum at all. Uh, knowing that information, we were in touch with the Massachusetts Historical Society and filed an archaeological site form with them, uh, informing them about the the discovery, uh, they assigned it an archeological site number, and this um, once dusted over collection of arrowheads became part of the official archeological record, which uh, again was another very important part of this analysis project. Moving forward, um, the next collection I looked at was what I referred to as the General Schoolhouse Museum collection. Uh, this was the largest collection at the Historical Society. It consisted of 411 artifacts. Um, it probably originally came from multiple artifact collectors, um, but unfortunately documentation associated um, with these artifacts has been, been lost to time. I believe that most of them originated on Cape Cod. Uh, the exception is the image of the projectile points or arrowheads uh, on the left side of the screen right now. These are what I would consider to be exotic um, artifacts. The stone materials and both the types of points are much more common in the Midwest. Uh, some of them might have come from as far away as California. How they ended up at East Ham is somewhat unclear. Um, however, I feel like you know, the Cape being a place where people come to retire, maybe someone that was involved in artifact collecting um, somewhere else had moved here and ultimately donated their collection to the local historical society. 
Um, artifact collectors are also known to uh, trade trade materials. Um, and I think, you know, when they go on vacation or whatnot, if you are walking the beach every day finding arrowheads, you might do that in other locations also. Um, however, like I said, most of the materials did come from East Ham and I'm gonna use materials from this collection to uh, talk about the 13,000 years of Native American occupation on the Cape. So the earliest Native Americans to live on Cape Cod um, are what we refer to as the Paleo-Indians. Uh, these were small bands of highly mobile hunter-gatherers. Um, they were adapted to caribou hunting, which you might think is, you know, odd for Cape Cod. Uh, but, you know, 12,900 years ago, when these people colonized the region, we're in the tail end of the last ice age. The environments are drastically different. It is much colder. Um, the Cape was most likely characterized by a mix of open grasslands, uh, spruce forest, possibly some tundra, um, essentially caribou habitat. Um, sites of this age in New England are generally considered to be rare. Um, on the Cape, they are exceptionally rare. And there were actually no artifacts um, from this time period in the schoolhouse collection. But, you know, since they were the earliest inhabitants, I, I thought I would start here. Um, one reason why artifacts of this antiquity are not represented in the collection uh, probably has to do with sea level rise. Um, at the, the time of the Paleo-Indian period, there are still um, massive ice sheets further uh, north of here in, in Canada and elsewhere in the globe, and much of the Earth's water is, is tied up in these ice sheets. The sea level is much lower. The image on the far right, it shows an approximation of what the landmass of Cape Cod might have looked like at that time. So you have a very small population uh, living on <clears throat> a much larger landform, most of which is underwater. So it's really difficult to locate sites of this age. Um, However, it does not mean that they're not found on the Cape. The artifact on the far right is a fluted point that dates to between 12,900 and 12,500 years ago that was found in Chatham um, about a decade ago. Excuse me. <clears throat> the, um, the cool thing about this point is, besides its, its age and rarity, is the stone type that it is made out of. It is. Um, <clears throat> it's a stone called jasper that outcrops in southeastern Pennsylvania. And um, the presence of such an exotic material from you know, over 500 miles away on Cape Cod really speaks to the level of mobility that Paleo-Indians were moving around the landscape. Again, likely following uh, herds of caribou who are highly mobile animals. Moving forward in time, um, the two oldest artifacts in the East Ham Historical Society collection um, are these points here that date to the early archaic period. I believe only one of them is actually from Cape Cod, and that is the one on the right. This is a Hardaway point that dates to sometime between 9,500 and 10,000 years ago. Um, <clears throat> it is it's not surprising to me that this period is not well represented in the collection. Um, sites dating to the early archaic period are generally rare in New England. And again, because of, of sea level rise, uh, they are even more rare on Cape Cod. At the beginning of this period, as the, the maps on the right show, uh, Nantucket Sound was dry land. You could, you could walk all the way to Nantucket. I imagine people were using the landscape um, you know, out, out there that is now, um, is now submerged by sea level rise. The, we have um, some very important changes that are, are happening during this period. And are, for one, there are even fewer sites in the Paleo-Indian period um, in general in New England. And that is because this is a time of dramatic uh, environmental change. We have come out of the last ice age. We are now entering 
the Holocene, which is um, the environmental um, period that we live in today. Um, during that transition, you have a change from open grasslands to a low productivity boreal forest. It does not support big populations. And near the end of that period, you have deciduous forests from the south uh, moving north. And with the forest composition changing, um, people are, are changing the types of animals and resources that they are hunting and collecting. So we see a shift um, from going after a focus on herd animals like caribou to uh, forest dwelling animals uh, like white-tailed deer. And we see a change in artifacts um, related to those environmental changes. The points get, get smaller. They are now almost exclusively made from local materials that you can um, pick up here on the Cape as far as exotic ones that come from far away. Um, and people have just, uh, they have changed to their subsistence technology to, to focus on, on deer and other um, animals in a mass producing forest. But again, sites of this period are very rare. It's not very well represented in the society collection. Uh, we have a lot more points that and artifacts that date to the, um, the next period, what we refer to as the Middle Archaic, um, which is a reflects a general trend in New England uh, as a population expansion at this time. Uh, people are almost exclusively using uh, local stone materials to produce these artifacts. Uh, this collection of spear points here are um, Neville, Stark, and Merrimack types. They generally date to between 8,000 and 6,000 years ago. Uh, these projectiles predate the bow and arrow by thousands of years. They would have been launched with a spear throwing device called an atlatl, which I have shown on the right. This functions sort of in the same way that a, um, one of the plastic ball throwers I see people use for their dogs on the beach work, where it extends the length of your arm and lets you uh, throw an object with more speed and, and velocity, which allows for greater distance and more accuracy. Um, anyway. Uh, Moving on, we didn't just have projectile points from the Middle Archaic period in the uh, schoolhouse collection. We also had groundstone tools. And groundstone tools are um, used in heavy woodworking. Um, it's a different technology to produce them. They're tools like axes and adzes and gouges. Um, the images shown here are four different adzes and a gouge um, from the Historical Society collection. Um, these, the presence of these artifacts say a few different things about what's going on at this time period. Um, for one, we have a reduced mobility. People that are, are making these heavy tools are not moving as much around the landscape. It would be cumbersome to carry them with you. Um, the heavy woodworking tools also suggest that dugout canoes are being produced um, by this time. There is a general uh, focus on fishing. We see a lot of Middle Archaic sites on the Cape um, focused on the major rivers, uh, especially those with herring runs. Researchers believe that by 8,000 years ago, the modern herring has been established. So somewhere like uh, the Stony Brook in Brewster, that's a great place to hang out um, and watch the herring today, was also a great place to hang out and catch herring 8,000 years ago. And there are a lot of Middle Archaic sites along the mill ponds and in, in that valley um, in general. So that's the, the Middle Archaic. <laughs> Moving forward in time, um, one of the best represented time periods in the schoolhouse museum collection uh, is the late archaic period. Uh, we have numerous projectile points and also ground stone tools um, that date to this time. The late archaic period is thought to be a time of 
uh, great population expanse in New England and on Cape Cod. Um, we see archaeological sites in every conceivable microhabitat. People are living along uh, major rivers, secondary streams. Uh, they're living along the coast, um, kettle ponds, freshwater wetlands, um, basically anywhere that they can extract resources. Um, the artifacts here uh, represent there are, there are three different stone tool making traditions in the late archaic period. Uh, each one of them was represented in the Schoolhouse Museum collection. Um, these may represent different populations of people that are interacting at that time. They may represent uh, subtle changes in, ap in adaptations to environmental change that was occurring at this time. I was not surprised to see a lot of late archaic points in the collection. Again, these are all um, local lithic materials. You have your rhyolites, quartz, and quartzite. People are uh, picking up cobbles on the beach or in, in streams locally and, and producing their, uh, their stone tool technology in that way. In contrast to the late archaic, where we have um, basically a ton of stuff in the schoolhouse collection, we have only uh, seven artifacts that date to the next period, and that those are the um, <clears throat> seven projectile points on the left side of the screen here. Uh, these are Rossville and Lagoon types. The exact same types of points were recovered um, at the Carn site on Coast Guard Beach. That was the uh, National Park Service excavated in 1990. There's some great information on that site. Um, online. Uh, it's interesting that there, there aren't many points um, from this time period, and that's because there are not many archaeological sites that date to the early woodland. Um, this was a, a time of environmental uncertainty. Uh, the period coincides with almost 800 years of sustained drought, uh, and that could definitely have um, create a, a stress on the population. Uh, so I didn't expect to find uh, a lot of materials from this, uh, this time period. Uh, a big defining technological change that occurs in the early woodland period is the invention of ceramics. Now, traditionally, archaeologists associated ceramics with agriculture. Uh, but we now know that here in the Northeast, ceramics predate agriculture by almost 2,000 years, uh, and that these vessels um, were actually used to render things like fish oil. Uh, there's been some great studies that looks at the little bits of, of residue on the inside and figures out what was being cooked in them. And uh, pretty consistently, it comes back that it was uh, some kind of, of fish that was processed. Um, there was no ceramics in the schoolhouse collection, which is kind of interesting. I don't believe that they don't have uh, ceramics in East Ham. In fact, I, I know they do. I think this is more of a reflection of collector bias. Um, for one, finding ceramic pots archaeologically, they are usually in uh, a bunch of tiny pieces, which is shown at the, in the bottom center of the, the slide. Those are, are fragments of uh, a similar pot to, to what is shown above. Um, they're also made of local clays that were fired at a low temperature, and they essentially look like dirt. So I think without a trained eye, it is very hard to find these types of artifacts. I also think that because they essentially look like small crumbly pieces of dirt, that they were not as attractive to artifact collectors as something like a complete spear point might be. And this is a bias that I see over and over again at museum and other collections like at the Historical Society. Um, especially those that were assembled by amateur or avocational archaeologists, where there's just a lack of ceramics. So again, I'm, I'm not surprised uh, that there were not any ceramics in the schoolhouse collection. Another really important aspect of the early woodland period is the stabilization of sea levels at this time in the beginning of salt marsh and estuary formation. The image at the top right shows the formation of the barrier beach at Sandy Neck 
and the development of the great marshes in Barnstable and Sandwich that form behind it. The top of the image shows the marshes at 3,000 years ago. They're represented by the small dark spots in the overall green landform. And the bottom shows the marshes as they are today. Uh, so they, it gives you a, a, a look at the development of these salt marshes over the last 3,000 years. Well, we know people in the early woodland period were exploiting these habitats because we begin to find accumulations of marine shell that we call shell middens. I have one shown on the bottom right. The lens uh, of white within the soil column is the accumulation of marine shell. Now these deposits are extremely important to archaeology for a few reasons. For one, if you remember, I said that organic materials do not preserve in the acidic soils that we have here in New England. An exception to that rule is if the materials are found within a shell midden context. The calcium carbonate in the shell will neutralize the acids in the soil and allow for the preservation of bone or seeds and other organic materials. And it's in these types of deposits that we have learned um, so much about native diets in the past. These deposits are also important because they are visible archaeological resources on the landscape and they can be easily identified uh, when they're eroding out of marine scarps or around the edges of estuaries. And because of this, they were targeted by early artifact collectors and amateur archeologists. I would guess that many of the artifacts within the Historical Society collection came from shell midden sites. Now, everything I've talked about so far has predated this period. However, it is common to find older artifacts below the shell midden horizons as people reoccupied similar locations over thousands of years. So I do think that a lot of the artifacts within these collections are probably related in some way to shell midden deposits. The next time period represented in the Schoolhouse Museum collection is the Middle Woodland. Uh, there were several points dating to this period in the collection. However, the two that I'd like to highlight are shown on the top left of the slide. These are Jack's Reef type points and they are typically associated with the adoption of the bow and arrow. Um, they can really be considered the first true arrowheads. Now these types of points are found throughout eastern North America from the Midwest all the way to the Atlantic coast. They are very similar in size and style over that area and researchers believe that they are associated with uh, the spread of bow and arrow technology, which appears to have happened very quickly between 500 and 700 AD. Um, these points are usually associated with some type of exotic lithic material, suggesting that there were um, extensive trade networks at this time. And the points shown here sort of fit into that. The one on the left is made of a rock called Hornfells, which is known to have been extensively quarried in the Blue, Hill, Blue Hills just to the south of Boston during this period. Uh, it's likely that this point, or at least the flake of stone that this point was made on, uh, originated from that source in the Blue Hills. Uh, the point on the right is made of a rhyolite that was probably picked up uh, as a cobble right here um, on the Cape. Uh, aside from bow and arrow technology, another really important development during the Middle Woodland, uh, which is somewhat unique to the Cape or coastal areas in southern New England, is that this is the first time that people are living in one place throughout the year. And you usually don't have this level of sedentism without agriculture. Um, but the extremely productive estuary and salt marsh environments like that of the Nosset marshes allowed people to settle down before they became farmers. And when I'm talking about settling down, I'm not suggesting that native peoples no longer um, exercise their seasonal round. I'm just saying that these seasonal movements uh, became much uh, more restricted and people moved around a much smaller area. Um, they would likely have been contained 
within a single estuary system moving between its lower and upper reaches depending on the season of the year. Uh, they're also using nearby kettle ponds at this time. And I just want to uh, take a minute to think about the abundance of resources that somewhere like Nosset offers. If you picture yourself standing at the upper parking lot on Fort Hill, you can look out over the open ocean where you have access to fin fish and marine mammals. Um, you'd have access to cobbles to make stone tools right there on the beach. You'd have access to fish and crustaceans and shellfish in the estuary in Town Cove. You'd have access to waterfowl and other animals in the marsh. Um, and if you turn around, you have access to the plants and animals of the upland forests like deer. There's also a freshwater swamp a little ways beyond the tree line. And all of those resources are available within a distance of a mile or two. And it is these productive environments that allowed people to more or less live in one place throughout the year during the middle woodland period. And we know they were doing so because we find large shell middens with a diversity of species, some of which like striped bass or certain types of uh, ducks, different waterfowl are only available during specific seasons. And, you know, finding uh, remains of animals that are only available in the summer and those that are available in the winter in the same midden suggest people that were using that area to deposit um, their trash, for lack of a better term, um, during both seasons. You can also look at the growth rings on shellfish and those can be indicators of season of harvest. So by looking at these seasonal indicators, uh, we learned that, that some sites were used um, throughout the year. And the bottom right of the slide, I have another view of a shell midden um, that dates to the middle woodland period. And this one is, is much thicker and uh, more diverse than the um, one that I showed previously for the early woodland. Moving forward in time, the next cultural period, the late woodland, was the best represented in the Schoolhouse Museum collection. And by um, the best represented, I mean we had the most stuff dating to this period. Um, Levana triangles, like those that are pictured here, are considered a hallmark of this period. And there were numerous examples of this point type in the collection. We actually had examples of this point uh, in the different stages of manufacture, with some just being roughed out triangles Others were complete finished products, and then others showed evidence of being um, resharpened, or if the tips broke off, um, maybe a new tip was napped onto that point. Uh, these were almost all made of locally available stones, same types of um, rhyolites that could have been picked up on the outer beach or along Cape Cod Bay. Uh, it's not surprising to me that the late woodland was the best represented period in the Schoolhouse Museum collection. Uh, sites of this period were also the uh, most common found during the archaeological survey of the Cape Cod National Seashore. Um, that survey found that late woodland sites were more numerous and larger in size than any of the previous periods. And this suggested a more intensive use of the Outer Cape at this time. Um, so what's going on in the late woodland? Um, first, we have people that have been living more or less in the same area for at least the last thousand years. Uh, and we assume that there were, you know, population growths between the middle woodland and the late woodland. Uh, people are living in dispersed villages that consist of individual homesteads or, or wigwams. Um, around estuar estuaries like Nosset, sort of how a modern neighborhood is set up where people have their individual homes, their individual plots of land, um, but it is sort of, you know, considered part of a, a larger group of, of settlement. Uh, people were continuing to acquire resources by hunting and gathering. They're using the same suite of resources they used before, um, but around 1000 AD, at the beginning of this period, 
um, people add maize horticulture to their subsistence base. Maize is rarely found in New England, and that's probably a preservation issue. And it takes a special set of conditions um, for a kernel of corn to survive a thousand years in the soil here. And most commonly, um, they need to be burned to survive. Um, and when they are found and dated, uh, all the dates come back to after 1000 AD. So that's when we think um, maize horticulture really gets adopted in New England. Um, direct dates on charred maize kernels indicate that horticulture didn't become super popular until after 1300 AD. Uh, there have been sites in Orleans and Brewster um, that have had maize kernels recovered, and the dates um, for them are both uh, 1300 AD or later. Um, there was also a cornfield uh, with the individual corn hills, uh, very similar to how early European explorers um, described uh, native agriculture that was found um, covered by a sand dune in, in Yarmouth, which is an amazing site. Uh, maize pollen has also been identified at the Carn site on Coast Guard Beach here in East Ham. Um, but go, getting back to the fact that maize horticulture um, doesn't happen until the late woodland period and, and really doesn't take off until the midpoint of this period, it just it, it shows that the, the image of farming communities that we get from the early European explorers uh, you know, really only represents the last few centuries of life before Europeans got there. Um, and, you know, we, we have some evidence of horticulture in the Schoolhouse Museum collection in the form of pestles. Uh, there were a few pestles in the collection. I have one of them shown here on the far right of the slide. Uh, these tools were used for grinding plants like maize into a meal. Um, but these types of tools were also around for a long time and were used to process wild plant foods as well. So I can't say for sure that this particular artifact dates to the late woodland, but it is a type of tool that was in use at that time. Um, it's, it's certainly possible that it, it, it dates to the late woodland period. We have a lot of projectile points um, from this time period in the, in the collection. The next period, the contact period, is the last period that I'm going to talk about during this presentation. But it doesn't mean that, you know, native people stop living on Cape Cod at, at this time. In fact, we have very active tribal groups in Mashpee and on Martha's Vineyard and tribal members that live all around the Cape today. Uh, the contact period is the last era of native peoples living in a traditional sense. Um, so as you may have guessed, the contact period is characterized by uh, native contact with Europeans, uh, first in the form of explorers and then fishermen and colonists. Archaeologically, this means that we find European materials, namely pieces of brass, glass beads, and other small trade items on Native American sites. Uh, in the Schoolhouse Museum collection, we have one possible artifact that dates to the contact period. That is the small triangular Madison point uh, shown here on the left. These points were used at the very end of the late woodland and into the contact. So it's hard to say exactly when this point dates to. Um, but one thing that is really interesting is that there is not a lot of material from this period. Um, in the collection, and that sort of fits into a regional pattern where contact period sites are hard to find. This is a little weird because uh, we know that the Cape in New England was heavy, heavily populated at this time, and we have documentation about where some of the sites are, like around the Nauset Marshes. Um, However, I think the, the difficulty in finding contact period sites um, is that they tend to be located in places of early European settlement. Um, so, 
if you take Plymouth or Boston, for example, we know that there were native villages there. Um, some of the reasons they haven't been found is that because you have 400 years of European development sitting on top of those sites. Uh, but even if these sites are hard to find, you know, we can still learn a lot about this period um, through the accounts of early Europeans, however biased they may be. So, you know, fortunately, we live in a place um, that was, was visited early. Um, you know, the Cape was visited by numerous Europeans in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, we can probably assume that Verrazano sailed by in 1524. We know that he stopped in Narragansett Bay and then along the coast of Maine. Um, to get between those places, you have to come by Cape Cod. His account does not mention if they stopped or not, uh, but I'm sure native peoples living on the Outer Cape you know, would have been aware of, um, of Verrazano uh, ship sailing by. Uh, Gosnold visits the Cape in 1602, Martin Pring a year later, and uh, Champlain visited, visited in 1605 and 1606. And his accounts are the most detailed. And uh, fortunately for us, uh, in July of 1605, Champlain made a map of Nasset Harbor, which is shown uh, on the slide on the right there. Uh, this image shows a the dispersed village settlement model that I discussed for the late woodland period. Uh, you can see individual wigwams and horticultural fields surrounding the estuary. And, you know, I think this probably is what Nasset Harbor looked like in 1605. The accuracy of Champlain's maps um, have been confirmed archaeologically, um, in part by the excavations of the uh, buried cornfield at the Sandy's, Sandy's Point site in Yarmouth, where the layout of the cornfield and some other features are nearly identical to Champlain's descriptions of, of Nosset, uh, Stage Harbor, and, and Plymouth from this time. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool to, um, you know, to, to have an image um, of native life uh, as sort of the very beginning of when it started to be recorded um, right here in East Ham. Well, that pretty much wraps up the presentation. Um, I would like to conclude by saying um, that I used my analysis um, of the collection to help develop uh, at least part of a new exhibit at the 1869 Schoolhouse Museum uh, this exhibit is on the native peoples on Cape Cod, and the part that I contributed to focuses on stone tool technology over the last 10,000 years. I encourage everyone to visit and check it out once the museum reopens after the, the virus business is over. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Patty Donahoe and Eileen Seabolt for facilitating this project. For everyone that helped uh, arrange the Zoom presentation, all of you for um, taking time to, to watch the presentation. And um, at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions. So uh, thank you very much.